Der Emmanuel Charpentier, der Christian Pape, der Mr. Aufderheide, dear Humboldtians, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests. It's wonderful to be here again. I'm a bit exhausted because I just come from a review meeting in fluorine chemistry. 
but um, if you've done enough quantum mechanics, then you learn that um, there's this uncertainty principle and where you are and when you are there isn't, can't be determined that precisely anyway um, at the same time and place. But anyway, it's wonderful to be back here and now and to have all of you back here now. We are very extremely pleased and indeed honored and proud to be your host, the Humboldt Foundation's uh, host for the annual meeting again. After these three years since last time, 2019, it's wonderful to see and to have all of you here again. Um, welcome to Berlin. Welcome to Freie Universität Berlin. Um, it's great that you are here. As an institution founded on premises of international cooperation and solidarity, and indeed this wonderful building is part of this international solidarity, Freie Universität has been proud to host the annual gathering of the Humboldtians several times again and again, and I would like to th take this opportunity to thank the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for all it has been doing towards the internationalization of science and of academia, towards interdisciplinary exchange, and towards cooperation across borders. And of course, I say this in the summer of 2022, where all of this is values that we have to think about and work on again. And I would ask you to understand these thanks also as a political statement in these times of threatened budget cuts where international cooperation in science and in the humanities, international scientific exchange, and the science diplomacy that we Germans are so proud of, rightfully, are more important than ever. The past two years, accompanied with lots of changes and ruptures, have been long, especially with regards to international cooperation. The pandemic has brought changes to everybody's life. However, international affairs, mobility, and in-person exchange have been especially affected as we had no possibilities to travel and to meet for a long time and for a time that felt long. We experienced new formats of international cooperation and took great steps in the sphere of digitalization. As a side effect and as a paradox result of the pandemic, some international ties became even closer as we introduced new digital communication tools and saw each other virtually much more often than we did before in some cases. However, Zoom and WebEx, at least for now, cannot substitute a real meeting among real people, which goes along with perceiving each other as persons, talking to each other formally and informally in varying constellations, communicating emotions through body language instead of emojis. Conversation is the slowest form of human communication, as I learned from an American philosopher and perhaps satiricist. Conversation is the slowest form of human communication. Coming together in the full sense of the word as an international community is crucial for dialogue and understanding different backgrounds and perspectives. Thus, I'm even more happy that this annual meeting takes place at Freie Universität in person and everybody together in this room. And I'm pleased to see participants from all over the world, to see you, and to give all of you and all of us the opportunity to meet and to exchange ideas. The pandemic is not the only challenge we have to cope with. And as we also all know, the pandemic is not over. It's not over in Germany and it's not over in the world. However, international academic cooperation is currently overshadowed by 
another major crisis, the Russian war against Ukraine, which started in February, or perhaps started eight years ago, and cannot be described, in other words, as a shocking tragedy. We are witnessing massive and until recently unimaginable shifts in many respects, political, economical, and in international cooperation. Academia in Germany, Europe, and all over the world has shown solidarity with the victims. Many institutions have welcomed students and academics who had to flee their home countries. This meeting is also an opportunity to, to exchange experiences in that field, a field that we at Freie Universität have been considering as one of our core topics of international affairs in the past months. This has also challenged this university, which understands itself as an international network university, and it also led to massive support for refugees, to scholars at risk. It has also led us to immediately suspend our strategic partnership with the State University of St. Petersburg and to close our Moscow office and to now move it to Tiflis, Georgia. And it has also led us to state that Ukrainians, but also Russian students and scholars, are welcome here. The world we live in has changed dramatically. In fact, the world has been changing all the time and will most likely also continue to do so. And with a changing world comes the need for us to react and to change ourselves and our concepts of the world. From an international perspective, this gets especially visible. When it comes to such interdependencies, the insights of Werner Heisenberg, recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics 1932 and the first president of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, when newly established after World War II, seem to me highly relevant. To quote from a lecture, Role of Modern Physics in Human Thinking, held in 1955 at the University of St. Andrews, he said, whenever we proceed from the known into the unknown, we may hope to understand, but we may have to learn at the same time a new meaning of the word understanding. In that sense, dear Humboldtians, let's take the chance to inspire and to learn from each other while we, in our research and beyond, proceed from the known into the unknown and extend the meaning of the word understanding. The word understanding has many meanings and it is our duty to work on these and to expand them. I wish you, ladies and gentlemen, many interesting conversations and meetings during this annual meeting of the Humboldt Foundation a successful time in Germany, full of excellent ideas embedded in this wonderful worldwide network of the Alexander from Humboldt Foundation. Thank you. So, Magnificenz, lieber Günther Ziegler, dear Günther Ziegler, dear Professor Charpentier, dear members of the German Bundestag, dear representatives of our donors, dear colleagues, presidents of science organizations and universities, dear Professor Günther, dear guests, and not to the least, dear Humboldtians, it feels so good to see you here all face to face, in real life 3D. And so, we're really welcome to this annual meeting of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And the whole foundation and all hum Humboldtians who are here with us tonight are very delighted, I guess, and I'm personally very happy that we have been able to resurrect a great tradition and to get together 
in this marvelous building here of the Freie Universität Berlin. And so my first and sincere thanks goes to Günther Ziegler for having us here again after two years break due to the pandemic. Thanks a lot for allowing us to use this marvelous building again. Thank you. This we haven't forgotten after two years of a break to have applause at the right spot. So, A4H gemeinsam, AVH together, Alexander von Humboldt together. This is the motto of our meeting and I think it's most apposite because after this two years hiatus necessitated by the pandemic, it's a real fine feeling, as I said before, that the Humboldt family, we all can finally meet again in person. So and first, since we heard about the word understanding and the many meanings of understanding, let's practice an example of democracy. I was told to give a speech mixed in German and English. And I know you're all eager in learning German and you're very good in German in practicing and training and it's so nice to learn the German language. But so let's see, who wants me to give the speech in a mixed fashion, German 80%, English 20%, raise your hand. I haven't told you about the alternative yet. <laughs> Not really overwhelming. Who wants me to give the speech in English? As good as I can speak English. <laughs> well, well, not so overwhelming, but it's the majority, I guess, right? So <laughs> I'll stick with the English language with my German accent. So we are really delighted that you're part of the Humboldt Foundation's network, all of you who are here. We count on your knowledge and creativity and your humor as I have just felt. We are really curious to hear about your thoughts, your opinions, your ideas, not just through digital connections, but through verbal expression and through your language. And we look forward to your trust and friendship. And this, with this, I would like to welcome you to Germany on behalf of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Please be welcome, be happy and feel good in this great country. You and your work contribute to making our world a better place. Given the challenges we face, science-based solutions and decisions are more important today probably than ever before. There are many examples of this, climate change, sustainable mobility, diseases, nutrition, demography, digital communication, artificial intelligence, social cohesion, and the list could easily be continued. And in addition to scientific achievements that you all will propel and provide, what we need at least as urgently are dialogue, solidarity, cohesiveness, and as a fundamental basis for all of this, trust. Also, trust is an important basis for understanding. And our motto, AVH together, AVH gemeinsam, embraces this ideal of commonality that makes it possible to overcome the borders that we all experience these days, be they scientific borders or political borders. But how effective are those ideals that we all follow, that the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation follows, how effective are these ideals really when it comes to tough political interests or even a brutal life and death struggle like the Russian war against Ukraine? What have decades of exchange and dialogue with Russia achieved? Politicians in Germany are currently being asked and also science organizations and foundations like the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation is being asked a lot these days. These days. Also the media want to hear from us at the Humboldt Foundation how we respond to the war and what the point of our commitment to academic freedom and trust is. Has science diplomacy failed because it could not and maybe can never really prevent excessive of authoritarian regimes? Are we simply naive because we still believe in the power of dialogue and trust or scientific solutions? These questions call for differentiated response. Of course, we all do know that science diplomacy is not a means of ending aggressive disputes over political power. It doesn't make autocratic governments change their minds and it doesn't turn a despot into a good and nice person. To leave, believe otherwise would indeed be naive, I guess. 
but we certainly do know and fight for this, what our work and our network can achieve. So we know and have experienced how great the solidarity and the very practical help can be in our scientific network here in Germany. And just to provide some examples, together with the Carl Zeiss Foundation and the Springer Nature Publishing Group, we at the foundation have established the so-called Philip Schwartz Emergency Fund for refugee researchers from Ukraine. With a flexible portfolio of alumni stays and fellowship extensions, we offer assistance, and we offer assistance fast, unbureaucratically. Within a very short time, more than 200 researchers and institutions in Germany had contacted us and agreed to help researchers who had to flee Ukraine and offered them to work at their institutions. And this is really, I think, exceptional, and thanks to the universities, and thanks also for their unbureaucratic, very practical, and fast help in this respect. Thanks a lot. So, but we also know that we should beware of black and white thinking, of equating a Russian government with all sections of the population over which it rules. Shortly after the attack of Ukraine, as most of you have probably heard, research in Russia, including numerous Humboldians, publicly protested against the war and declared their solidarity with Ukraine and with all the people in Ukraine, despite massive reprisals. They are precisely these independent minds, the potential forces for reform that we have to reinforce and that we have to continue to reinforce. They are needed for the future of a democratic Russia and more provocatively perhaps, but nevertheless simply true, those forces are needed for a more peaceful world and they still need our support. And we know, not least from countless examples in many other countries in the world, how members of our network, the Humboldt family, get involved in politics. Sometimes they move on from science to important offices, such as science advisors to American presidents, whoever the presidents will be, president of the Constitutional Court in Georgia, or advisors to peace processes, such as in Colombia. And there are many other examples like this. In short, I personally, and probably you all, don't want to even imagine a world without this commitment, without scientific advice, and without this network of trust and dialogue in science. And I am certain there would be more and worse conflicts in and amongst our societies without these scientific advisors and these multiplications from science. Admittedly, I have to say, this science diplomacy is never really a quick solution or a quick fix. In the long term, however, the freedom of academia and the values lift in its orbit have a positive effect on the openness of societies. Of this, I'm personally convinced. And this is why I stand here as the president of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and you're all part of this family who supports exactly this opinion. I also have to say, academic freedom is not a theoretical ideal. Academic freedom must be lived in practice. We, the researchers, the scientists, and the scholars have a special duty to demand and uphold the values of academic freedom and thus to actively protect it. It's not just a theoretical term. Values such as transparent, unbiased research, the fair distribution of gains and respect for intellectual property. And more critically, perhaps than ever before, we must examine and enforce these values, not just theoretically, but practically at all levels, down even to individual projects and collaborations. And please keep this in mind, and I'm sure you all have this and will keep it in mind. So, dear Humboldians and guests of our annual get-together, of our annual conference, after two years of the pandemic, we have been longing for this day we could meet up again the A4H AVH together, A4H Gemeinsam. Also, for the true family celebration that I enjoyed a, much before the, a lot before the pandemic, that this conference has always been, the pandemic still means that something decisive is missing. And so I'm missing the laughing of children and the, your families. 
which we had always invited as well. When the German federal president invites us to his official residence with Kind and Kegel, as we say in German, as there is this real family feeling, and that will unfortunately be, mi be missing tomorrow. There will be sunny skies, there will be a blue sky, there will be this feeling in the gardens of Schloss Bellevue, but children will be missing, but we'll be make it and we'll be happy anyway tomorrow, I'm pretty sure of this. So it still will be a scene of a huge colorful garden party with unfortunately no children playing, but you are all invited you know, to leave your everyday habits. I'm not you know, motivating you to play, but you know, relax and have a good day tomorrow. So that will touch my heart, I'm sure. So we are not yet able to get together as freely as we used to, but still have to limit the number of events and contacts. But we are en route to greater freedom, not least to the achievements of science. Two years of the pandemic have often forced us in science and research to improvise, to utilize digital solutions, as Günther Siegler just said, in research and teaching, to deal creatively with bottlenecks such as in materials or to change research priorities flexibly and at a very short notice. And we, you know, were not too bad at this because there are many examples of developments and approvals like the revolutionary mRNA vaccine that have been developed and brought to the patients in record time to precisely, in precisely this flexible and very effective manner. What is needed are more digital communication and more flexibilities that are positive attainments and that we should take with us into the post-COVID area. And that's one thing we certainly all learned from this. Digital communication has not always optimal consequences, but it's an opportunity for more sustainable exchange. In the future, we will probably travel less and more consciously and use virtual contacts to deal with many things. For instance, routine interactions can be dealt with digitally. But two years of largely collaborating on screen have shown how much we miss personal encounters. And it is essential, as we all believe and as we will all know, for creati creative, trusting and productive exchange. So let's together find the right balance between virtual and real encounters and combine the best aspects of both. At the Humboldt Foundation, we are working on it, AVH together, A4H, gemeinsam, as our motto goes. We also have to realize that during the pandemic, junior researchers have suffered disproportionately from lockdowns and reduced mobilities. Moreover, traditional road distribution has been reinforced. All the more reason for us to drive diversity, whether regarding age, gender, or regional origin. The pandemic has sharpened our awareness of cross-border cooperation and solidarity, but there's still a lot to be done for sure. So let's utilize the momentum and the experience gained to make changes that will help us move forward and make the scientific world fairer and more penetrable. What I just learned yesterday on a meeting is that the contribution to high-rank scientific publications in high-rank papers from Africa before the pandemic has been zero. And I think that has, been, has to be improved in the future as a matter and as a consequence of diversity. This is what we should also learn from the past and improve and use, if there's no better solution, digital communication and digital connection to involve inclusion of these partners and these scientists and researchers. So digital communication is an opportunity for more sustainable exchange. In this way, I think, after having learned also from the pandemic, we can improve productivity and make better use of the potential inherent in the diversity of our ideas and perspectives, which is the hallmark of our worldwide network. And with some pride and not even a trace of false modesty, I should like to mention at this point that groundbreaking discoveries are not so uncommon in this network in the Humboldt family. And there is a living proof among us because, after all, our speaker who will give the keynote lecture is Emmanuel Charpentier. 
a, a Humboldtian who made precisely one of those groundbreaking discoveries I mentioned. De Emanuel introducing you would, in essence, require only three facts to be mentioned, if I may do so. Number one, as I said before, you are a Humboldtian, most importantly to us. Number two, you developed what is considered the breakthrough in life sciences in decades. It's called CRISPR-Cas in the scientific world or genetic scissors in the public world, referring to genome editing, the specific tailoring of the molecular building blocks of our genes. And you will let us more about this in your talk and in your lecture. And this indeed has created, as everybody here recalls, a real revolution in molecular genetics and applications in life sciences, and particularly also in medicine. And as a natural corollary of this, and this is my point number three, you were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020 together with Jennifer Dauda. Congratulations for being a Humboldtian and for receiving this prestigious prize. But, there's a but, I wouldn't be the president of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation if not mentioning that you became a member of the Humboldt family much earlier, before you got the Nobel Prize. It was back in, we discovered, it was back in 2014 when you accepted an Alexander von Humboldt professorship and moved from Sweden to Germany. Here you became head of the Department of Regulation in Infection Biology at the Helmut Center for Infection Research in Braunschweig and Hannover Medical School. In Umea, Sweden, Sweden, you had been an associate professor since 2009 and headed a research group at the Laboratory for Molecular Infection Medicine. And even prior to that, you had been trained and worked in Paris, New York, Memphis, and Vienna, to mention just a few spots where you have been scientifically. And today, you are the founding scientific and managing director of the Max Planck Unit for the Science of Pathogens here in Berlin. So, to be honest, when we awarded you the Humboldt professorship, we could not really claim that we had discovered a rising star because you were already a star before. With a reputation as one of the most innovative researchers in the field of RNA regulation and the molecular biology of infections diseases worldwide. However, since the media also sometimes refer to the Humboldt professorship as Germany's Nobel Prize, we might claim you have awarded a Nobel Prize six years before our colleagues in Sweden had discovered you, <laughs> which is a good thing, I believe. Congratulations again. So there's some more final remarks because before I will ask you to give your keynote lecture. Dear Humboldtians, looking at you, I don't really know what your lives and careers hold in store for you and what prizes you may be awarded in the future. Personally, however, I assume that you will have an excellent career in front of you in research, even though it might not always lead to a Nobel Prize, but work on it. Don't give up, don't give up. And irrespective of this, we are already happy and proud that you are part of our big Humboldt family and do an excellent job in contributing scientific results to us and to the public. And as researchers, you too should be proud of your contribution you make to society and to solving our global problems. Continue to help us make progress that benefits everyone. Take the lessons of the pandemic to heart and shape a better future and harness the power of our network to do so. I hope you will have exciting encounters and productive conversations on your meeting. Talk to each other and not about each other. Discover new ideas and new friends. Here's the chance in real life 3D. In other words, enjoy the annual meeting of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Thank you very much for listening. So now, dear Emmanuel Charpentier, we are extremely proud and happy that we were able to recruit you and that you will provide the key lecture to all of us. And we are really eager to learn about the most recent developments in this break 
breakthrough that you have discovered. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so I think I have only half an hour. I just say only because I tend to speak long when, the <laughs> when I have the opportunity to do so. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today. I would like to thank uh, everyone who has made this event possible, and certainly uh, the president of the Alexander von Humboldt uh, Foundation, the general secretary, and also the president of High University at Berlin, and everyone here. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been, <laughs> uh, at, at some point in my career, I, uh, I was used to give a lot of speeches live uh, in front of a real audience, and, and surely it's a little bit new again for a, a lot of us, but I'm very happy that after three years, this event can take place. And uh, I have always been told, know your audience, and sometimes uh, one does not know exactly which audience we will have to <laughs> deal with, and I see a lot of young people, so I think I have to be also uh, somehow encouraging <laughs> in what I'm going to say today. Um, so uh, I don't know how to start because um, I think it's, it's very important that I explain you nevertheless, and this is, uh, I guess, um, the second slide that I have for you today that I really emphasize the, the mobility uh, that uh, was part of, of my life as a, as a researcher uh, and also to say a few words uh, with regard to <laughs> actually how uh, I ended up being selected for the Alexander von Humboldt uh, uh, professorship. So, I start with the thanks because I, I just uh, know by experience that we thank never enough, actually, the people we have been working with, the people who have been supporting us, um, the foundations who provide uh, also great support, the institutions, and as much as uh, the life of a scientist is uh, often dealing with frustrations, and it's not always... Uh, easy, as uh, you may have learned and as you will learn even more, um, there are a large number of organizations and people working to make your journey possible. And it's up to you to find you know, the right path that fits you uh, the best. And this has been uh, somehow <laughs> a, a constant uh, battle, I, I have to say, in, in my life but I think it's also part of, of success. It never comes without uh, dealing with uh, issues and learning how to resolve issues and find uh, the best way to reach your goals. If you have some, and I hope you can develop goals, as it was mentioned, uh, the world is quite challenging in our days, whether it is with regard to uh, the war, in Ukraine and other wars that uh, happen elsewhere in the world and will always happen elsewhere <laughs> in the world. And also with regard to everything that is climate change and other challenges also to deal with poverty and other types of challenges. And I think it's, um, it's very important that Obviously, you also get the message that, uh, specifically in our days, the future belongs really to you, and this is up to you to, to contribute to make uh, the world a, a better world. Um, it's it's uh, maybe you may find some difficulties specifically because here we we speak about um, a journey in science. You make it you may see it a little bit different you know, somehow with difficulties to, to follow uh, a path in, in science. Um, but I can tell you that it is very much uh, 
worth it and that uh, it's, um, you have different ways in any case to contribute to science, whether you decide along the way to uh, go for a scientific career in academia or more in the private uh, businesses or to support science. Um, but I think with all the challenges that we face, it's very, very critical to reflect on the fact that uh, we are all sitting here because we were lucky to receive uh, an education at uh, excellent universities and that um, I fear a little bit in the future that we face the reality that less and less uh, young people are interested in uh, you know, staying in the field of academia or contributing to make sure that the knowledge is transmitted to the next uh, generation and that uh, excellent education can still be provided all over the world. And uh, I see a lot of young faces, and you think you're young, but you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> days pass very fast, and there's something that I learned in my career very, very fast, actually, even as a, as a PhD student, is that my next phase was a, a postdoc, and the postdoc would be two, three years at the time, at my time, it was two, three years. Actually, I ended up uh, doing three postdocs in five years. But then after, if I was continuing in the academic field and if I had this chance, I would be a group leader. So I became a group leader very young and then the responsibilities were on me. And so all those um, responsibilities come to you much faster than, than you think. And you may doubt that you're not able to deal with it, but uh, you know, like, uh, it was for me, um, let's say, the, the key for my success is to always think, and I think it's an advice that I say, always keep, um, how do you say, always try to get the global picture. This is very important to uh, understand the global uh, picture. So where you work, where you want to go, and always adapt uh, if you're a scientist, a scientific methodology with always constantly um, revising your, uh, your past, always uh, challenging yourself, and always nevertheless understand that everything goes step by step, uh, and always accepting and understanding that the the people around you are, are very important. You cannot be successful if uh, you don't have people around you. So we are very happy to have foundations who can help us uh, financially. Alexander von Humboldt Foundation is a great foundation. I have to say, I don't say this because I'm invited here today. And for the little history, because I got awarded the professorship officially in 2014, but for sure you have a process of selection. And actually, it was announced in 2013, but it's just that the ceremony um, occurred in 2014. And it uh, takes uh, some time, even though I, I guess uh, you may have uh, understood that uh, the foundation is quite efficient. But actually, for the history, I started to be contacted by uh, the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research and the Medical School of Hanover in February 2012. At the time where, and you will see, I will go fast through the scientific discovery, but at the time where I had published with my group uh, in Umeo, uh, in Vienna, actually, Vienna and Umeo, uh, a nature paper, and the science paper that was uh, showing uh, how the, the last step of the CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism was working and how to harness it as a, as a genome engineering technology was not yet published and even not yet completely written. And so I was very careful with to whom I would uh, reveal the, the nice aspect of the last step of the, <laughs> of the story. But I saw that for my interview, it was important that I say a, a few words. And I think it was understood, actually, I was very lucky that my colleagues at Helmholtz had understood uh, William were believing in, in uh, the impact that uh, the last steps of the discovery would have. And this is thanks to the president of the Helmholtz Association, Jürgen Mluneck at the time, who thought that uh, I would be a, 
um, a very good candidate for this Alexander von Humboldt professorship. So when we wrote the application, uh, it was not clear whether, <laughs> or let's say I was not uh, considered as a uh, completely rising star. So I think it gives even more credit to uh, the review process of the Alexander von Humboldt um, Foundation. Uh, and I would like to thank you for it because, and here I will um, start also to say something with regard to how a foundation can be key in, uh, and always looking for money. I mean, I was always uh, obsessed by writing grants when I started my team at the University of, Vie of Vienna, being quite, uh, not actually having any uh, start money and writing grants, grants, and grants. So you learn that Sometimes you know that your success rate is according to the general success rate that will be 10, 20%. For the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, I was very happy because for once when I looked at all the criteria that uh, I would be uh, evaluated upon, I realized that actually I would fit all the criteria. And so all my efforts in teaching and, and different aspects of of my scientific life as an assistant and associate professor actually will pay off and I, had, uh, I would have very good chances to be awarded the, the professorship. Uh, what was key for me is also the funding because it was allowing me to set up a department very fast at uh, the Helmholtz uh, Center for Infection Research and this was important because I knew after publication of the science paper in 2012 that everything will go very, very fast and I will need support and also because this will support my research on Streptococcus pyogenes which, silly enough, it is as such. Uh, the Helmholtz Center at the time was evaluated and there was a choice of you know, which pathogen to work on and always a choice that you know, the pathogens to, to work and to study at the center would be pathogens that would be maybe more um, relevant to um, Europe uh, and less relevant uh, maybe um, you know, for other countries outside Europe whereas s pyogenes actually, and this is the source of the CRISPR technology, is actually a pathogen that uh, affects a lot of uh, patients, specifically in India and other parts of, of the world. So it was a way for me to continue my research on Streptococcus pyogenes. So as it was said, uh, the research on CRISPR actually started in Umeo, in Vienna, then after in Umeo, uh, then after at Almolz, and now I'm, in, uh, I'm at uh, Max Planck. And I start by thanking uh, the key members of my lab for this uh, discovery. Uh, so a number of people, including Christoph Shilinski and Elitsa Delcheva, who are very, very young, master students and young PhD students. Uh, I had a collaboration with a group of Jörg Vogel in Germany, a collaboration with a group of Jennifer Dauna at University of Berkeley, and a collaboration with a group of Eugenie Kunin at uh, Bethesda. So collaborations are very important, and you're all uh, here. Most of you are not uh, from Germany, obviously. And uh, it's also a, a point that I want to emphasize if, uh, and this has also been key for the success, actually, of my lab, is to try to develop a, a multidisciplinarity. So in a way, trying to be uh, independent in, in um, certain aspects of, of of the research we wanted to conduct, uh, but then not be shy to reach out to collaborators. And when you think uh, that specifically this was a case for CRISPR, you anticipate you know, what could be uh, the value of what you work on, and you start to uh, work on other aspects uh, of, of your project in collaboration and uh, are always encouraged my, uh, the people of my lab to collaborate, even though for sure it was not easy the last um, two years. Um, so the, the research for CRISPR, and um, I like to go back to the history and I'm going to try to be fast, but what is very important for me is that it resonates a lot in uh, what we have experienced the, last, the past two years, actually, uh, which you know uh, is about uh, uh, a very nice virus, which decided to infect uh, all of us, or nearly all of us. And uh, it's all about, you know, viruses, uh, in infectious diseases, uh, immunity, uh, uh, therapies, uh, RNA, and CRISPR, it's uh, about this, actually, at least uh, 
from um, what uh, the, the research, the type of research we, we did um, on CRISPR in, in my lab. So my lab has been working for quite a long time on Streptococcus uh, pyogenes, that is a bacterial human pathogen, a strict uh, human pathogen that you can find only associated in the, in the human host. It's responsible for a large range of, of diseases from mild to more severe infections. Uh, I pass the details of the, of the infections uh, caused by uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, but it's uh, con still considered the top 10 uh, pathogen in, in the world. Um, we have always been interested in my uh, laboratory in understanding different uh, aspects of uh, regulation happening in this uh, pathogen. Uh, so, studying different types of, of mechanisms uh, that uh, would allow to explain and understand uh, how virulence factors and other types of, of factors are produced by this bacterium uh, upon encountering different stresses that can be found in the, in the human host. And to try also to decipher, in a way, new pathways and identify new molecules, always with a goal, but this it comes from my uh, uh, education at the Pasteur Institute in France, with a goal to maybe find uh, new uh, ways for uh, novel therapeutic interventions, which is very important in the case of bacteria, or also alternatively new genetic uh, technologies, having in mind that bacteria and viruses are the main sources of uh, different types of, of molecules and components that uh, have been key for molecular biology and, and genetics. So when one works on, on bacteria, this is always a little bit the types of applications that we could potentially uh, find, and also for sure bacteria that are also uh, key in, uh, for biotechnology purposes. So in the case of trying to find, um, let's say, new mechanisms for new ways for therapeutic interventions, or so something that is important to keep in mind is that we are happy to deal with uh, a viral uh, infection and where we are so, so lucky to have the possibility to be vaccinated and have a vaccine that has been developed so fast with bacteria, it's another story. Uh, you all heard about uh, how bacteria developed antibiotic resistance and this is the next challenge in the next uh, decades. It will be to, to deal with uh, novel infections with multi-resistant bacteria against which we don't have really a lot of alternatives. And when you develop uh, an, an antibiotic, so for sure you have vaccines uh, developed uh, against uh, certain um, bacterial species, um, but otherwise you deal uh, with uh, bacterial infections by treating with antibiotics and Unfortunately, we lack uh, now antibiotics, and, and silly enough, the last, the past 15 years, uh, the, the industry has a little bit gone away from uh, the development of novel antibiotics, as well as the academic research has, has been a little bit going away from the antibiotic resistance field. That was actually my field of research when I was a PhD, and I needed to leave this field if I wanted to have funding to, to do science. So there was actually a big effort uh, recently also uh, from Angela Merkel to uh, point out, uh, it was three years ago, two, three years ago, uh, actually before the pandemic, to really point out uh, the necessity to continue and to have really a, a real focus on, on research uh, that would allow to understand better antibiotic resistance in, in bacterial pathogens and other um, pathogens and also to boost uh, the research in, uh, in this direction to find new antibiotics. So we have always been interested in my lab in, uh, in these mechanisms and specifically we were interested in a class of small regulatory RNAs. So I, I guess the basics of molecular biology is that uh, the, the DNA uh, is, uh, you know, is trans translated into proteins with an intermediate molecule that is a messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA can uh, actually is not the only RNA molecule. You know that you have also the transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNA that contributes to the translation of, of proteins from the messenger RNA. But you have also other types of, of RNA molecules 
that depending on, uh, on the organisms, whether they are prokaryotes or eukaryotes, are called small regulatory RNAs or, or small non-coding uh, protein, um, uh, small RNAs or macro RNAs or small interfering RNAs. In the case of bacteria, they were actually uh, uh, identified in, uh, in the 80s and uh, they can act uh, differently to change the, the, the expression of genes. So they can interact directly with messenger RNA and affect uh, the stability of this messenger RNA. They can also interact directly with the messenger RNA and affect uh, the production of, of proteins. They can also interact directly with proteins and tighter away the proteins from their functions. So when we started to work uh, on s pyogenes, we started to focus on some specific small RNAs, and we were very happy to focus on some small RNAs, which we could show had uh, an effect on the regulation of virulence factor expression, so small RNAs that will affect uh, virulence. Um, but we were interested in finding uh, more of those uh, small RNAs, and we uh, were actually uh, interested in uh, finding also novel classes of small RNAs that could potentially work uh, with a totally different mechanism. So the idea was to find small RNAs that could be more universal with a totally novel mechanism. And as a matter of fact, at the beginning of 2000, small RNAs that will interact directly with the DNA to affect uh, the fate of the DNA were still not identified. And, and this is what CRISPR brings. So the CRISPR technology, most of you may have heard about this technology. So as it was mentioned, it's called genetic scissors for the, for the public. That's why you have the, the scissors here um, represented. But in, in principle, the scissors are, are, uh, are a, a protein called Cas9, and that is an enzyme. So it has enzymatic property. It, it has the ability to cleave the DNA at specific uh, sites. Uh, thanks to uh, also um, an RNA molecule uh, that works uh, as, a, as a kind of guide for this uh, protein to find the exact site on the DNA to be cleaved. Um, I have to say that after uh, Cas9 guided by uh, the, the RNA is cleaving the, the DNA, the, the rest is really done by, by the cells. So if you don't repair uh, the cleavage of, of the DNA, it's problematic. Um, because then you can affect the replication of the DNA, but if you can uh, repair this cleavage, and if you associate uh, Cas9 uh, and guided by this RNA molecule by other types of, of tricks uh, that, um, that can, uh, let's say, uh, bring the tool to perform uh, different types of, of modifications, then you have a very versatile tool that is RNA programmable, and this is what the what uh, is the CRISPR-Cas9 technology is about. So it's programmable by RNA, and it can actually um, uh, trigger different types, depending on how it is designed, different types of modifications whereby you can uh, modify uh, the DNA at will. Uh, historically, it is important to mention that uh, in the history, uh, nothing much happened in the 19th century. I mean, nothing much, actually, a lot happened, but uh, uh, maybe more in the concepts of, of really the, the laws of, of genetics with Darwin, Mandel, and the, the DNA that was isolated in 1871. Uh, then the past uh, century was key uh, in 1944 and 1953 to, to show that the DNA was a carrier of genetic information that uh, the DNA double helix, uh, the structure was, was established and that the code in the, in the late 60s, the genetic code was deciphered. And then, um, thanks to researchers who focus on bacteria and viruses, a lot of uh, proteins and enzymes were discovered uh, that were shown to be very useful to actually trick the DNA and recombine the DNA. And this was really the start of molecular biology and genetics at the end of 60s, beginning 70s, uh, whereby, uh, as you know, there was a possibility to clone DNA, amplify DNA, sequence DNA. So now when uh, we talk about amplification by PCR, everyone knows what we are talking about. And, and then, for sure, a lot of progress with regard to different genetic approaches, and also the sense of using RNA. So now you have understood that RNA molecules are great, right? They can be also um, used for, <laughs> for uh, vaccine uh, strategies, but uh, RNAs, as I mentioned, they can uh, also be great as regulatory molecules and actually also be great as 
uh, components of, of genetic tools, and this was uh, already discovered in the 90s with uh, these small interfering RNAs that can uh, really um, be used for RNA-targeted uh, uh, genetic engineering approaches. Uh, then for sure, every uh, biologist is really needs molecular biology and, and genetics. This is really key to understand the functions of genes, to be able to acquire knowledge on really the, the different uh, types of mechanisms existing at the molecular uh, level and cellular level. And we always, uh, for sure, wish to be able to perform uh, our genetics in a very precise manner. This I said uh, at the fundamental level, not speaking about all the applications that also require very targeted gene therapy. And the zinc finger nucleases, talent nucleases, are actually engineered nucleases, but that are uh, originating from uh, natural, um, let's say, features of nucleases existing. And those nucleases were engineered at the beginning of 2000s. Um, and they actually do exactly what Chris Barkas is doing, except that um, to engineer those nucleases was a little bit more cumbersome because the code uh, that is retained in these nucleases to know exactly where the cleavage should take place is retained within the protein. So it's always, uh, one has always enge to engineer a new type of, of nucleus protein for a new uh, genetic modification to uh, to be done, whereas with CRISPR-Cas, it was, it's easy because it's RNA programmable, so the Cas9 protein is here to cleave, and this is the RNA component that just needs to be um, modified to find the right site on the DNA of, of interest to be cleaved. So historically, our research started with, uh, as I said at the beginning of my talk, to try to find new small RNAs in Streptococcus pyogenes. And here it's, a, again, a very good example of sometimes how research goes. Uh, we had this RNA, this is just a northern blood analysis showing uh, the expression of this RNA in, in Streptococcus pyogenes. So we found a lot of RNAs, but we focused on this one because it was well expressed, and, and also because it had a very nice target that was a messenger RNA coding for a virulence factor. And so we said, great, this RNA has a role in regulating virulence, so, but we could not make any sense of this regulation. We understood right after. So. So it was a little bit problematic, and we were working on other small RNAs, and it was difficult to find a target and, and a mechanism. But what was clear with this uh, small RNA is that it was encoded by a piece of DNA that was located next to DNA that was highlighted already in 2006-2007 to code for a CRISPR-associated system. And CRISPR are based on proteins and RNAs, and we were also, therefore, interested in working on CRISPR because we understood that the, the function of these CRISPR systems were just starting to be discovered, and uh, they also were uh, working together with regulatory RNAs. Uh, so the idea came after to actually maybe think that uh, this uh, RNA molecule named tracer RNA could maybe have a role in uh, the function of the CRISPR system that was encoded in the vicinity of this tracer RNA. And this is how the CRISPR-Cas9 um, um, developed. So, um, guess uh, viruses are not only infecting us, they're actually infecting uh, every organism. You also have viruses infecting viruses. And S. pyogenes, like any other organism, can be infected by viruses. So for bacteria, they are called phages, bacteriophages. And what they do to the, to the bacterial cells is that they can kill the bacterial cells. Or they can also, in the case of Streptococcus pyogenes, very interestingly, uh, so this is uh, phages that are called um, temperate phages, lysogenic phages, those viruses, uh, they can, upon infection of Streptococcus pyogenes, they inject uh, their DNA, and the DNA of the virus can integrate into the DNA of the bacterial cell. And this can bring new virulence factors for the bacteria. So in principle, those uh, phages in infecting aspergenes are known to contain uh, one or two very important virulence factors, and by, um, in a way, infecting aspergenes, they contribute to the diversity of clinical isolates that will encode different types of virulence factors, and will also allow to explain the different types of diseases that are caused by streptococcus uh, pyogenes. So, uh, for sure, uh, S. pyogenes, like any other organisms, has, have evolved different ways to evade um, 
you know, viral in infection. Uh, so you have different uh, ways to do so, and actually one of them is restriction modification system and has been used actually to uh, actually uh, understand, uh, you know, uh, and identify all these restriction enzymes that have been used for cloning and molecular biology uh, tools. Uh, the CRISPR-Cas, it's one of the immune systems which uh, microorganisms have evolved to fight viral infection. And it's an adaptive immune system in contrast to the other systems that are more considered as innate immune systems. So adaptive, it means that you always have a recognition of the virus and the machinery that is going to be, uh, to be triggered to be able to uh, recognize uh, the virus upon a second infection and being able to fight uh, this virus. And the way it works is that it's a machinery, and this is a key for the, the technology, that uh, is originating from a system that is composed of, of proteins that are encoded by the Cas genes, here represented in blue, and an RNA component that is encoded by the CRISPR array. So this CRISPR array is a series of, of repeats, or short sequences, that are, uh, have the same uh, sequence and are repeated, they are represented in black, and they are interspaced by other sequences that are actually have as origin viral or other types of mobile genetic um, element sequences. So they can originate from uh, viruses, also from plasmids, and other types of mobile genetic elements which are known to, to infect uh, macroorganisms. And the way it works is that when uh, a bacterium is encountering here, for example, a phage, uh, the phage will inject uh, its DNA. There will be recognition of this uh, invading DNA by the CRISPR machinery. One protein will uh, cleave a, a portion of the of the DNA of the phage and will integrate it into the CRISPR array. And so this CRISPR array, in a way, it's, it's a kind of history of all the memorized infections by different types of mobile genetic elements. And this array, that is uh, the history of the different infections, can be transcribed into RNA, a long RNA molecule that will be processed, cleaved, to produce mature CRISPR RNAs, each corresponding to one type of infection that has been encountered in the past. And all those mature CRISPR RNAs will associate with a complex of CRISPR-associated proteins. This was a dogma when we started to work on CRISPR. And will guide, in a way, this complex of CRISPR-associated protein to the invading uh, virus upon a second infection. There will be a base pair recognition, a recognition of this virus uh, through the, the mature CRISPR RNA. And then one of the, of the protein of the complex will cleave uh, the DNA of the virus, and if you cleave the DNA of the virus in bacteria, unfortunately, in contrast to uh, our cells, the repair systems are, of the DNA are, very, uh, are not very efficient. So in principle, what will happen is that you, you, you have uh, uh, an effect on the replication of the DNA of the virus, and this is a dead end for the virus that cannot replicate its DNA and cannot propagate from one cell to another one. So this is what the CRISPR system is about. And what we did in my lab and in collaboration with, uh, after the group of Jörg Vogel and Jennifer Darna is to aim to understand uh, how um, the, a certain type of CRISPR-Cas, because it's a largely evolving system, like uh, you have uh, understood by now that viruses evolve extremely fast with different mutations. This is the nice word of evolution of the macroorganisms. The CRISPR-Cas systems have largely evolved. CRISPR-Cas9 is only one of such systems. And the key for us working on s is that we had the chance that the, the clinical isolates we were working on had this specific CRISPR-Cas9 that ended up being extremely minimal. Instead of a complex of uh, CRISPR-associated protein being involved in the recognition of the phage, there will be only one protein, and instead of one CRISPR RNA, that will be two RNAs. So what really made the difference is this uh, tracer RNA, and the fact that it was uh, forming uh, a duplex with a, with a CRISPR RNA, and that this duplex could be uh, simplified uh, by linking the two molecules by a, a linker, and then having a programmable system whereby one could actually program the system by just changing the, the piece on the RNA molecule that uh, base pair with uh, DNA to be cleaved. And this is how the technology evolved. So what is really neat in, in this discovery is that um, 
for sure, it's the chance to have worked with the right back to our species, the chance to have uh, uh, come to, uh, let's say, study a mechanism that is by nature um, extremely efficient, yet sophisticated enough to be able to develop this technology with different versions. We started with uh, version, uh, you know, 1.0 and uh, multiple versions have been uh, developed thanks to a lot of scientists, developers, uh, genetic engineering uh, specialists, uh, uh, basic researchers, uh, uh, so a lot of scientists who saw a great potential to finally have a tool that will facilitate tremendously the genetics of the organisms of interest. Whether it's working on plants, or on modal organisms such as flies, fishes, mice, organoids, and more importantly, uh, human cells. Um, having said this, what I like to say is that um, this tool will not have had so much impact if it had been discovered, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, because it benefited tremendously from uh, years of, let's say, past 10, 15 years of, of tremendous uh, efforts uh, in, of the scientific community to master uh, all these technologies of deep sequencing, master all these technologies of how to culture human cells, organoids, uh, all those uh, technologies as well with regard to imaging and that uh, all of a sudden made really much sense of this technology. And that's why we saw a lot of scientists have, have uh, jumped on this technology. The evolution is important. I just mentioned this because I'm glad, I mean, I'm not, I'm not happy that we all deal with, uh, uh, with SARS-CoV-2, <laughs> but um, as a biologist, just uh, um, at least, um, let's say, satisfaction that maybe now the public understands to which extent the microbial world has evolved and to which extent, uh, you know, we can learn a lot from, from those, those microbes that know how to adapt, evade, and, uh, and survive. And uh, so it's, it's a large battle, uh, specifically in the microbial world, if you take viral infections, you know, bacteria are not uh, human beings, so uh, you have a, a very interesting uh, evolution and a, and a very strong evolution. Big deal, you still have the population surviving, so it's a very, very fast evolution and, and very fast uh, mutation rate. And for the CRISPR-Cas9 system, what was very, very interesting is that at the beginning, when we started to work on it, uh, we uh, could appreciate uh, the research done by our colleagues, by informaticians, who uh, would have already pointed out uh, this uh, system in a large number of bacterial species. And where we could appreciate the evolution, and this is by uh, looking at what could be conserved actually in, uh, in this system that we understood very fast in my lab what could be, uh, you know, how the system could work. So what I want to say about this is that this RNA molecule that I talked to you about, tracer RNA, initially we thought that it was an RNA molecule that would be only specific from Streptococcus pyogenes, so we could not understand why we would see it uh, having a role in the CRISPR-Cas9 system that was found everywhere. But then we realized that the CRISPR-Cas9 systems are largely evolving in terms of sequences, uh, but that what is conserved specifically in this system is the fact that there is a small RNA existing, being able to base pair with a CRISPR RNA, forming a duplex, and uh, guiding Cas9 to the site of interest, even though the proteins are also extremely diverse in nature, but there is a conservation of domains that explain you know, how the system works. So it's always very important to have the, the possibility to study diversity. And also here, a chance for me to tell you that CRISPR-Cas9 is not the only system existing. You have other types of CRISPR-Cas uh, system that have been uh, discovered since 2015 specifically. So you have large classification of CRISPR-Cas system. The CRISPR-Cas9 is the class two with uh, the number two in, 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 in red. So it's type 2A. But since then, other types of systems are so quite um, uh, simplified in nature, uh, were also harnessed for technologies. And this also allows to, to say that this tool is important because 
as the, the, the cell biology field, uh, for, for example, has a little bit been, um, how do you say, uh, suffering from the fact that uh, the studies were done with, uh, let's say, a minimal number of, of, of cell lines, which everyone knows are, are not really the same, maybe in nature, from one lab to another one. And always the, the wish to be able to work with cells and organisms that are more, uh, you know, relevant to, to nature, specifically in, in biomedicine, to be able to work with human cells of patients or primary cells or cells that are or, or organoids or, or other types of, of uh, models that are more relevant to the clinical uh, situation. So um, the CRISPR-Cas technology has, has really uh, changed in this matter. So it, it, it's in a way what I like is that it's a tool that comes from evolution of microorganisms, but that uh, allows to provide a tool that allows to simplify the genetics in different types of cells and organisms. So allowing to uh, study better the diversity of the world. Uh, you may have heard that the technology is very useful for the production of, of safer uh, plant crops by being able to perform, um, let's say, uh, genetic uh, engineering in plants without uh, having the issue um, which uh, was the, the problem with the former technologies that were used is of having uh, foreign DNA uh, still present in the plants after the genetic engineering, so uh, CRISPR allows to do more precise genetics. Uh, what is really interesting beyond the plants is all the biotechnology world, for sure, as I said, the basic science and all the, the research and development happening in pharmaceutical industries whereby there is always a, a wish to work with uh, as I said, human cells to develop these screens that will allow to find new targets for therapeutics, or also to understand better, uh, you know, backgrounds of diseases, whereby with all the sequencing techniques now, uh, we came to the point of discovering a lot of, of mutations in, in humans, which we think could be um, the reasons for a certain types of disease, and it's very important to go back to, to the bench and do some research and development to understand whether it is indeed the, the case and to be able to develop therapeutics in, in this matter and also develop models of diseases that allow to test better therapeutics in development and the great uh, applications that are nevertheless, and this is uh, challenging, but uh, is obviously happening and it's true, uh, to develop uh, the technology as a direct medicine to treat human genetic disorders. So this was uh, actually a point uh, that I made quite um, early on, and I co-founded two companies. Uh, one is called CRISPR Therapeutics and has been working over the past 10 years on, on developing the, the technology uh, for uh, treating um, human diseases, and um, actually, as others also have, but CRISPR Therapeutics has, has shown very nice uh, data with regard to uh, being able to now uh, treat patients with sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia with a combination of uh, CRISPR-based uh, gene editing and cell uh, therapy. And this is a, a great uh, improvement for the patients which uh, otherwise have to undergo uh, some um, issues of, of um, treatments uh, that are used um, uh, conventionally. Um, Actually, in my laboratory, we, we, we don't work a lot on CRISPR those days, but we work a lot on other aspects of, of um, still continuing some projects that I started a long time ago on the regulation of mechanisms in Streptococcus pyogenes. I, I, um, I am very <laughs> determined to continue this type of, of research, and it's becoming even more and more important uh, with regard to what we have been facing with SARS-CoV-2 that will not uh, leave us alone and <laughs> that we, we will have to learn how to, to deal with. What we all hope, however, is that we are not going to uh, face another pandemic with uh, another pathogen, whether it's a virus or a, a, a bacterium, uh, for which we will not have a, a fast uh, you know, um, treatment, as it has been the case for uh, SARS-CoV-2, at least with a vaccine that has shown to be very efficient, specifically against the Delta variant. Um, 
I would like to stop my talk here because I'm sure I was longer than uh, what I was uh, allowed to speak, but I hope I could convey to you some messages and specifically that you never know where research can bring you. Um, but CRISPR-Cas9 was actually a research in my lab that has happened extremely fast and that was really a story black and white in contrast to other projects that uh, were related more to uh, you know, biological phenomena that are less black and white and more difficult to understand. But I have to say that it was also, uh, it came uh, at a point during my career where all of a sudden I could put together everything that I had learned during my PhDs and my postdocs, and I was really ready to tackle this project. And that's why I always encourage, and because you're here today coming from other countries, I always encourage uh, the scientists to understand that mobility is very, very important. You learn so much by going to different labs, even sometimes changing projects or trying to collaborate with other people and open your, you know, your, your horizon. Because as a scientist, you tend to always have a very you know, narrow project, surely. You know, it's uh, methodologic. It takes some time but try to uh, broaden your universe and, and uh, it's a very multidisciplinary world in our day, so you cannot be specialized on everything. Uh, so that's why collaborations became more and more important so, and I would end up with this. Thank you very much. for showing the world how pathogens can be used as genetic tools for motivating the young to travel and to you know, go their way to reach their goals. And not to the least for your low day show on the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And this is a little token. It's a biography of our namesake, Alexander von Humboldt. No genetics involved, I can tell you. <laughs> but interdisciplinary approaches. Thanks a lot. One more point in our agenda, that is if we meet, science diplomacy is important, as we heard from our president, really excellent, outstanding research is part of the Humboldt Network, and I really thank you, Emmanuel, this certainly has been a highlight in many, many years, thank you. But also we learn, want to learn from each other, how is it to be a Humboldtian, how does uh, life go as a guest in Germany? And I'm very glad that we have two reports from uh, Humboldtians today. And the first is from patient Chattakuta, who actually was very eager to meet you, Emmanuel, because she also involves your technique in her work. But she got stuck in Hanover, which is, of course, terrible. I apologize, because it's not her fault. It's the fault of the Deutsche Bahn. We were so proud of it. We were so proud of it. And today, uh, well, you know, probably all of you have experienced it, what happened. Patient Chatekura was born in 1985, and she uh, studied at the National University of Sciences and Technology in Zimbabwe before she moved to South Africa to the Northwest University, where she gained her PhD. And she now is a Humboldtian uh, in Tübingen at the Max Planck Institute for Biology, Detlef Weigel's lab. And she is dealing with uh, subsistence crops in southern Africa, so very, very important for the uh, livelihood of local populations. And they are vegetatively propagated, which is difficult, and she works on the improvement of the regener regenerability. Uh, and I already introduced, so, so she will be here in a virtual talk. I hope it works. We'll see how it works. Uh, because, as I said, she just got stuck, so we hadn't really planned this. And the second uh, speaker is Maria Rita Ortega Vega from Colombia. And she came uh, this year from uh, the University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, where she received her PhD just a year ago. Uh, she's an electrochemist, and she works with Professor Stefan Kaskel at the Technical University in Dresden. 
where she develops um, novel electrochemical sensors to do diagnosis of diseases in, uh, in salivary um, secretions. So that certainly is important for medicine, but I think we start out with patients Chattukuta. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me clearly. Hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me clearly. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Please stand up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm really honored to be giving you this talk. I woke up at 6 a.m. today to catch two trains to Berlin. Um, the first train was delayed, and I had to make three other connections, and they were all delayed. So, um, but I'm glad that we can rescue the talk using technology. I'll be talking to you about exploring the regeneration of important subsistence crops from Southern Africa. Um, MFK Fisher, the American writer on the art of food, once said, first we eat, then we do everything else. Food is a basic necessity and plants are the base of the entire food web. In my home country of Zimbabwe, people primarily shop for food from markets and or they grow their own. The food products in the supermarkets and e-commerce sites in Zimbabwe are remarkably similar to those here in Germany. However, many of the food products at the outdoor markets, um, such as Mbare Musika in Harare, are not considered mainstream foods by plant breeders. So you find that many of these um, food products are also not really recognized by multinational food processing companies. So these auto markets sell crops that are not highly commercialized, but they form a significant part of the diet of the urban poor, smallholder farmers, and rural dwellers. These crops are under-researched, and they are grown mainly for subsistence. They are highly nutritious and well adapted to poor climatic and environmental conditions, such as drought and low nutrient soils. But subsistence farming is generally susceptible to myriad diseases due to the informal sources of planting material from which seed is procured. Um, in addition, the extension of the range of diseases and pests due to climate change further exposes these crops to more diseases. So the opportunities for improvement of subsistence crops are great because it is much easier to improve a crop that has not been the target for breeding and for which research has been far from optimal compared to your common row crops, such as wheat or maize. So plants have an amazing ability to regenerate whole plants from cuttings, shoots, suckers, and even single cells. As plant molecular biologists, we can exploit this regeneration ability to make desired improvements in the parent cell, um, which will be expressed in the resulting regenerated plant. Although regeneration protocols are well established for most commercial crops, this is not the case for subsistence crops. The disruption of commercial crop production due to extreme weather conditions necessitates the establishment of efficient and reproducible plant regeneration protocols for subsistence crops. As a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute of Biology in Tübingen, I am studying how turning off and turning on genes from plant cells, um, known as leaf mesophyll cells, affects regenerability of plants. I use techniques such as plant tissue culture, molecular cloning, genome editing, which I've already heard about today, as well as um, plant transformation to identify the key genes that may be targeted for improving regenerability. So, 
Um, the insights from this study, I hope, will be used to target particular genes in subsistence crops from Southern Africa, such as cassava, sweet potato, and horned melon, to improve the plant's regenerability under the conditions that are specific to this region of the continent. Establishment of um, targeted regeneration protocols for subsistence crops will facilitate the improvement of these crops for provision of clean planting material and integration of disease resistance, thus reducing the reliance on highly commercialized crops whose share of the market is threatened by climate change and geopolitical factors such as the war in Ukraine. You could also look at it this way. According to the Zimbabwe Commercial Farmers Union, it costs 1,200 US dollars to grow a hectare of wheat in Zimbabwe against 230 US dollars in Ukraine, only to yield 1.8 tons per hectare, as opposed to 4.2 tons per hectare in Ukraine. Two weeks ago, when the price of bread sharply shot up by 40% from 450 Zimbabwean dollars to 650 Zimbabwean dollars, Zimbabwean news outlets reported that many consumers were now having their morning tea with sweet potato and pumpkin instead of bread. It is therefore imperative that subsistence crops be brought to the fore of the market and plant molecular biologists such as myself can work at the molecular level to help improve these crops. Um, I am privileged to be funded by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation who fund the person and not the product. I am supported by my host at the MPI for biology Prof. Detlef Weigel, to pursue a topic which I'm passionate about and which is really close to my heart. His laboratory hosts students and staff Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as our General Secretary of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation has correctly introduced me, I am Maria Rita Ortega Vega. I am Colombian born, uh, but as I did all my research career, my, all my science career in Brazil, I am also Brazilian. I am a Brazilian researcher. And today I would like to introduce to you some uh, my research proposal for my Humboldt postdoc research fellow, and um, well, I think that I can start here. Okay, um, this proposal is focused on the development of nanostructure transition uh, metals. Uh, transition metal-based electrochemical sensors for a salivary uh, detection of urea with the aim of using this uh, material, this electrode, for detecting kidney failures. Uh, I am hosted by Professor Dr. Stefan Kaskel, as our General Secretary said, uh, at the Technische Universität Dresden. Uh, and Okay, the motivation and background is based on the e-health. E-health is the electronic health. Uh, now, with the advance of technology, we have, for example, glucose sensors that allow uh, diabetic peop people to uh, take better care of their disease or even for detecting uh, diseases in their very uh, early stages. 
uh, and also uh, based on the need for the application of fundamental science and uh, bringing it towards technology and its application in medicine, um, all joining all this uh, knowledge is, is important for um, elaborating, creating these devices. Based on the knowledge that kidney disease is a silent disease that costs too much to public, public health care systems, as it happens in Colombia and Brazil, that uh, support most of our population. Um, and also, this is a disease that is reaching even more, uh, even younger people now, and since some, some years uh, ago. Uh, it is interesting that it